This podcast is graphic and deals with mature subject matter. You're listening to True Crime Chronicles. You're on the bottom out here, and you're treated like you're on the bottom by the cops, by the drug dealers, by everybody. You're less than human. The grisly murder of a prostitute whose nude body was found in the Rosewood Cemetery 11 days ago. For True Crime Chronicles, I'm Jessica Knoll. And I'm Will Johnson. This week's story is about a serial killer, or possibly multiple serial killers, operating in Atlanta back in the 90s. Jessica, this story was underreported back then and, and still to this day is not well known. Right. During that time frame, there was a lot going on. You know, you had the 1996 Olympics. And then, of course, as everyone knows, the Olympic Park bomber officials didn't want anyone to know that there could be multiple serial killers, a single serial killer out there during this time because they were gearing up for a very large event in their city and what would eventually put them on the map. And there's actually a pretty major update to this story that we'll get to that involves a known serial killer, a very well-known serial killer. So let's get into this week's story. In 1994, Danny Egan was working as a homicide detective in Atlanta. On October 19th of that year, he's called to a scene in Southeast Atlanta. It's a scene he remembers vividly. The body of 39-year-old Valerie Payton is found in a field. She's naked and wrapped in a blanket. She had been raped, sodomized, strangled, and stabbed 50 times. She was described in the press as a crack addict, a prostitute. But she was also the mother of a nine-year-old, a son who would never see her alive again. Horrific crime. Uh left out in an open field where she could easily be discovered. She was just like thrown away like a piece of garbage. Committing a murder and leaving a body posed in a provocative, shocking way is something psychological that I can't get my head wrapped around. But I know there's something at play here that is making this guy do what he's doing. The cause of death was strangulation, but the brutality went even further. Her body had been mutilated by the killer. He also left a note. Brendan Keefe, chief investigator at WXIA in Atlanta, explains why he is quickly dubbed Mr. X. The reason they called him Mr. X was not only because he had signed the note Mr. X, but because the press coverage. The press coverage in that period in the mid-1990s described a killer who was going around uh, murdering prostitutes, and he was generally using strangulation, but he also used a knife. And in the knife, he would trace uh, or cut an X on the genitalia of his victims, some of them who survived. And those surviving victims describe being terrorized by him and him tracing an X in their private area with a knife. And then you have this man killing somebody, killed a uh, prostitute, and she was left with a note that said, I'm back, Atlanta, signed Mr. X. And with this note here, which was almost a taunt to the police of, screw you, you know, I'm here. Is this somebody that's saying, hey, look at me, I've done this, you can't catch me? Dr. Michael Arnfield is a retired homicide detective who's looked closely at the murders. The killer leaves a note saying, I'm back in Atlanta, signed Mr. X. Why the Mr. X moniker? I'm back, back from where? What happened before to make his presence in the city significant again? I can't stress how rare and significant this is. Fewer than 2% of cases, murders of any kind involve the leaving of a note or writing. But who was this Mr. X? What did he mean by, I'm back, Atlanta? My inclination would be, he's probably good for some other murder that we've never connected the dots to. You know, but it's really just common sense. You don't have to be a professional criminologist to you know, recognize that when a killer leaves a note on a victim, and the victim has been strangled, and that victim uh, has on them a message that says, Atlanta, I'm back. Um, back from where? As it turned out, there would be many more murders to try and connect the dots to. Dozens. All women, all prostitutes, all of them strangled. It's not uncommon for sex workers to be the victims of a serial killer. One, they're easy targets, they're easy prey. Two, uh, there's obviously a sexual nature to the crimes. Uh, and they're, you know, sometimes it's the killer is acting out something, you know, their, their mother was a prostitute or they see prostitution as dirty or whatever it is. Uh, very often the victims are, are, you know, sex trade workers. But the question then, the question still today, is there a connection between the murders and was it the work of a serial killer? Susan Drew was also an addict and a prostitute in the 90s. She knows she's lucky to be alive today. It was terrifying. You know, I lived out there, I lived out there wanting to die. You know, I mean, this was, this is not something I planned. I didn't, you know, as a kid grow up, say this is what I'm gonna do with my life. But this, the road I went down, and I hated the fact that I was out there on the streets away from my children. But once I was about to die, all I could think about is, my God, my kids are gonna, they're gonna know. They're gonna know what I was doing. They're gonna know how I died. And, and how humiliating for my children. I wasn't even thinking about me, but them having to explain that their mother died on the streets, prostituting herself. That's all I could think about was my kids. I saw no way out. I saw no way out. I never saw a future. She was also working on the streets in Metro Atlanta when prostitutes started turning up dead in the 90s. She believes she came face to face with the killer. She recounts at least three attacks. And one of them 
she believes was the serial killer, the uncaught serial killer. Uh, now, she is, by her own admission, a recovering drug addict. She was uh, really not supposed to survive the 1990s. I mean, the, the life expectancy of a drug-addicted prostitute on the streets of Atlanta, uh, it's not a very you know, long life expectancy. She not only survived the life of a prostitute and got out, but she also survived her own addiction and is in recovery now. Susan is frustrated by not being able to see some of the details now through the cloud of her own addiction, that when she was seeing these attacks that were taking place on her, she was also under the influence of substance. Substances. And so she now has the clarity of, of being clean, but she doesn't have the clarity to see everything except the most haunting parts, at, you know, feeling hands grasping her neck. Um, you know, at the very moment she believed she was going to be murdered, she says police and Georgia Bureau of Investigation agents you know, leapt out from, from behind cover, from behind trees and arrested this individual. We have no way of knowing you know, what that instance was, because she can't even remember the precise year it happened. She remembers where and she remembers other details. But, you know, it's it's both through the cloud of time and the cloud of addiction that she cannot, you know, identify the man who may have taken her life without some intervention by law enforcement. Susan does remember when he picked her up in a silver four door sedan just after 3 a.m. And that he wore jeans and a dark T-shirt and tells Drew that he's a police officer and reads her her rights. She remembers when he pulled out a gun and told her to get in the car and what he made her do at gunpoint. She remembers when he got out of the car and she rolled up the windows, grabbed the keys and started the car. And I took off with him hanging inside the car, hit a tree in the back of this yard. I hit the tree and he put me in the passenger side and started strangling me. And I'm begging, begging, pleading for my life. I don't want to die. Please don't kill me. All the way over there into the corner and um, hit a tree. He dumped me in the woods. He thought he killed me. I thought he killed me. Susan survived the attack, but many other women didn't. But there had been stranglings. Many. You didn't know. You just hoped. You would survive. They knew they had a serial killer. This guy's not going to just hurt you and you're going to go get away. You're going to die. He strangled me. I know plenty of girls out here that got killed. That I have never been asked one question about where did they go? Did you see him in the car? I was out here a long time and I was never asked those questions. The murder started in the years leading up to the 1996 Olympics in Atlanta. The Olympic Games would catapult Atlanta into the spotlight. You can't believe this. Actually, here is like today is the day, man. Well, you know, Atlanta's a beautiful city to begin with. And when you add all the, all the Olympic flavor, it just makes it all the more wonderful. This park is gorgeous. The city of Atlanta today would not be the global center of commerce and trade and transportation without the 96 Olympics. The 96 Olympics were when Atlanta became a major international city. It, it quite literally put Atlanta on the map. And during that time, there was this sort of push to become the city Atlanta is now. This was all taking place uh, while Atlanta was becoming the city it is today. And there was a tremendous amount of political pressure on the police department to not even acknowledge uh, that there was a serial killer or really that there were rapists or any other kind of killers out there. And this is documented that the city um, and its leaders, particularly the mayor at the time, uh, were trying to make sure that this that crime uh, was not, you know, what Atlanta would be known for just as it was becoming Atlanta. And as more and more women, drug addicted prostitutes, were strangled on the streets of Atlanta, the city leadership, even then Mayor Billy Campbell, seemed to brush off the idea of a serial killer. Some murders over the last two years have some similarities. There's a huge headline indicating serial killer on the loose. That's irresponsible. But if it wasn't a serial killer, did it mean that the city of Atlanta was dealing with a string of isolated cases, 40 individual stranglers? Retired homicide detective Dr. Michael Arnfield sees evidence of six or seven serial killers operating in metro Atlanta at that time. Very few police departments want to admit that the term exists, much less that they have a serial killer in their city. I can only imagine in 94, 95, 96, the years leading to the 96 Olympics, the stigma associated with having a serial killer here in Atlanta. Law enforcement will deny this, but there isn't the political pressure to solve a series of prostitute murders. Uh, all you have to do is go back to the late 19th century with Jack the Ripper. You know, if they were killing people on the West End of London, it would have been far more political pressure on catching the, you know, the Whitechapel killer. But he was killing sex trade workers in East London. So, you know, this has been universal for more than a century. And it's certainly the case here. And so the murders weren't getting the attention that they deserved. They were forgotten victims. But between 1993 and 1998, 40 women were killed. Only six of those cases were ever reported closed. When you see one, two, three, 30, 100 in the same city, you know you have a problem. You need to treat these murders as a series, investigate them as a series, and proceed on that basis until proven otherwise. The retired homicide detective, Danny Agan, says his bosses didn't want the public to hear the words, serial killer. Most police administrators on the higher end would rather eat glass than say, we have a serial offender out of any any spot, murderer, sex offender, they were loath to say we have a serial offender. Why it was better to say we have 15 rapists at large instead of we have one rapist at large, or we have 10 murderers out here instead of saying we suspect we have one guy that's responsible for 10 murders. The evidence concluded that there was more than one suspect 
involved in all of these cases. So, of course, the sensational story is serial killer is at large, and police won't say, well, the police weren't saying serial killer uh, for certain because of a reason. That's because we didn't know. Eventually, and without explanation, the murder seemed to slow down and then stop altogether. They don't stop because they have a revelation that says, oh, I need to quit doing this. They stop for two or three reasons, one of which is they're in prison, they've died, and they may stop in the particular location where the crimes are being committed because they have moved to another place where they continue to do what they've been doing before. It's actually the most terrifying of all serial killers because we see boundaries. We see state lines, we see city limits. Law enforcement certainly sees jurisdictional boundaries, but serial killers are what are known as liminal figures. They are able to straddle both sides of these imaginary lines because they're not restricted or constrained in any way by a boundary. And in fact, they can keep their freedom and keep from getting caught and find new victims by constantly moving around. The most terrifying serial killer is the truck driving serial killer who, you know, basically goes through a town, murders a single victim, and then goes to the next state and murders another single victim. Is he a serial killer? Absolutely. But each of those jurisdictions thinks they have a single murder victim when in fact they have one piece of a very large puzzle. It would be over a decade later, in 2008, that DNA evidence finally led police to the man who murdered Valerie Payton, a 39-year-old mother whose body was found naked in a field. Michael Harvey was charged and convicted on malice murder, rape, aggravated sodomy, and aggravated assault in connection with a strangulation case. Her case is just one of a handful of cases that have been solved. But could the wrong man be behind bars? Could the evidence still point to a serial killer and not Harvey? This man who is the convicted Mr. X for this one-off killing has maintained his innocence from day one. He has been denied all of his appeals, but he has gone you know, to great lengths to try to prove his innocence from prison. And he's, you know, keeps getting hung up on the DNA that convicted him. But it could very well be a possibility that he was merely a John, you know, by his own statement, he doesn't remember meeting her because he was convicted years later. And it could have been, you know, a chance visit with a, with a prostitute who later that day was murdered by a serial killer. I don't know that I ever came to a conclusion one way or the other. You have to keep an open mind until you know all the facts. And the deal is, we didn't know all the facts back then. I don't think we ever came to a hard and fast conclusion of were we dealing with multiple suspects or one suspect or maybe even two suspects. We had more murders after this one arrest, but this indicated that we had more than one suspect. The, the prevailing wisdom from the cold case investigators with whom we have worked is that there were at least three serial killers operating, uh, you know, at the same time in Atlanta, and they were also, you know, hunting very similar victims. Decades later, 85% of the strangulation cases remain unsolved. But there's a new twist to the story. A confessed serial killer, now behind bars, has been describing victims. Is he connected to the strangulations? Could he be the serial killer who ended so many lives in the 90s? That man's name is Samuel Little, and he's quickly becoming the most prolific serial killer in American history. She had a life, and someone took that away. 31 years hunting for her mom's killer. And it's going to end with me getting the person that killed my mom. Pune Gray is closer than ever. So these are dangerous people. Extremely dangerous people. From the team that brought you Urge to Kill, I'm Ashley Porslin. Are you willing to go to war, so to speak? And this is The Yellow Car. I'm always ready for anything. Subscribe now. Jessica, what can you tell us about Samuel Little? He's been in the news a lot recently. Well, we learned about Samuel Little earlier this year when he started making some pretty startling confessions starting in Texas. And his confessions have made their way all throughout the country. He's drawing portraits of his 1990s victims for investigators, including in Atlanta during the time frame that we talk about in this story and with Susan Drew. And we're looking to see if there's any possible connection between him and, and these strangulations. Most recently, he confessed to about a half a dozen murders in Ohio. Brendan, what are you hearing? You know, to understand Samuel Little, you have to look at what he covets, right? I mean, this kind of goes back to the classic behavioral sciences model at the FBI. We have to look at what he covets. What does Samuel Little covet? He covets these victims. He owns them in his mind. Samuel Little draws these women and paints these women not to help law enforcement. He's doing it because it's his way of reliving and sort of continuing to own his victims. This is his menagerie. These are his most prized possessions, each of these murders. He remembers murders from 30 years ago in stunning detail. Detail. Uh, he's able to not only recollect how he committed the murders and where he committed them, but he's able to see their faces in his mind, see the, you know, the last thing these people saw was Samuel Little looking at them. And these women now are projected from the killer's mind onto canvas and onto paper with watercolors and pen and paint. And now law enforcement can take those and try to match them up with missing person cases. And this is really the confounding thing with hunting a serial killer. Even if you have a confessed serial killer, you may not have even discovered the body yet. So to try to match it up, well, he said he killed 
killed this woman on this month on this year. They may not have found a body in this month in this year at this location. In fact, there may still be remains yet to be uncovered. Uh, where the Atlanta police are, of course, is they're being very tight lipped. But that's convenient, given that, you know, just a year ago, they denied the existence of Samuel Little before he was identified. And what I mean by that is that the Atlanta police uh, were very critical of our reporting. We did a series called The Hunt, and our first story was called The Hunt, Atlanta's Unknown Serial Killers. The Atlanta Police Department took issue with the idea that there were any unknown or uncaught serial killers and were very insistent that we, you know, change the title of our story. They thought it was unfair. They thought it was sensational. Uh, well, now here we are a year later where we have, you know, depending on how far out you want to go from the Atlanta metro area, you know, we have half a dozen victims who were previously thought to be individual killings that are now thought to be Samuel Little's victims. We're again, we're waiting on confirmation, but every other case to which Samuel Little has, you know, admitted has turned out to be true if it's verifiable. So, you know, that's pretty strong. Plus, he has no incentive. They're not dangling a deal in front of him. He's never going to see the outside of any prison walls and will likely either die in prison or he will be executed for one of these crimes, one or more of these crimes. And so there's no incentive for him. And in fact, he's not being cooperative with law enforcement. He's enjoying uh, the ability to relive these moments every time he tells one of these stories or paints one of these pictures. So, Brendan, I, I mean, Samuel Little's motive, it's not about like remorse or anything. Yeah, I don't think Samuel Little's motivated, and obviously I haven't talked to him, but I don't think Samuel Little is motivated by some sense of altruism or remorse. He's motivated by having an audience for his show, and his show is The Murder Show. And the police are his audience. And so otherwise, he was simply putting on this show in his own mind. It's sick and it's twisted, but Samuel Little considers himself an artist, not just on canvas, but in blood. He has painted with blood across this country, and his sort of opus is to have killed all of these women. And each of them are sort of a, a pixel in the overall picture that he has created. And so his, you know, to be able to show it to the world is his sort of final presentation. And it's sort of like an art show for him. It's sort of like the, the, the gallery opening for him to sit down with investigators. He's getting a lot of gratification out of this, clearly. And that makes it even more disturbing because in order to get to the truth, we have to give the killer what he wants. But again, even if Samuel Little is linked to some, any of the murders, he's almost certainly not the only killer. You know, if it turns out Samuel Little indeed killed women in Metro Atlanta and around Georgia and the surrounding states, that does not mean he's the only killer because we still have dozens of unsolved strangulation murders of women. And it's unusual. In fact, the likelihood, according to all of the cold case experts, is that we have multiple unidentified, uncaught serial killers. All right. Well, our thanks to Brendan Keefe, chief investigator at WXIA in Atlanta, for telling us so much about, about this case and these cases and Samuel Little. Jessica, we're definitely going to have to do uh, an episode all about just about Samuel Little. Yeah, Samuel Little's story is definitely an interesting one, and the confessions keep coming. So he is growing into the most prolific serial killer in our country. All right. Thanks, Jessica. And thanks once again to Brendan. You can tell your friends to listen, subscribe, rate, and review our show on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, Stitcher, and all major listening apps. True Crime Chronicles is a Vault Studios production. We'll be back next week and every week with a brand new episode and a brand new case.